Book 20 Then the noble Odysseus bedded down in the forecourt, and spread beneath him the raw hide of an ox, and uppermost many fleeces of sheep the Achaeans had dedicated. When he had lain down, Eurynome threw a blanket over him. There, devising evils in his heart for the suitors, Odysseus lay awake, and out of the palace issued those women in, who in the past had been going to bed with the suitors, full of cheerful spirits and greeting each other with laughter. But the spirit deep in the heart of Odysseus was stirred by this, and much he pondered in the division of mind and spirit, whether to spring on them and kill each one, or rather to let them lie this one more time with the insolent suitors for the last and latest time. But the heart was growling within him. And as a bitch facing an unknown man stands over her callow puppies and growls and rages to fight, so Odysseus's heart was growling inside him as he looked on these wicked actions. He struck himself in the chest and spoke to his heart and scolded it. Bear up, my heart. You have had worse to endure before this on that day when the irresistible Cyclops ate up my strong companions. But you endured it until intelligence got you out of the cave, though you expected to perish. So he spoke addressing his own dear heart within him, and the heart in great obedience endured and stood it without complaint. But the man himself was twisting and turning, and as a man with a paunch pudding that has been filled with blood and fat tosses it back and forth over a blazing fire, and the pudding itself strains hard to be cooked quietly, so he was twisting and turning back and forth, meditating how, though he was alone against many, he could lay hands on the shameless suitors. And at this time, Athene, descending from the sky, came close to him, and wore the shape of a lady. She came and stood above his head, and spoke a word to him. Why are you wakeful now, O most wretched of all men? Here is your house, and here is your wife in the house, and here is your son, and he is the kind of son any man would long for. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her. Yes, O goddess, all you have said was fair and orderly, yet still here is something the heart inside me is pondering. How, when I am alone against many, can I can lay hands on the shameless suitors? And they are always here in a body. And here is a still bigger problem that my heart is pondering. Even if, by grace of Zeus and yourself, I kill them, how shall I make my escape? It is what I would have you think on. Then in turn, the goddess, gray-eyed Athene, said to him, Stubborn man, anyone trusts even a lesser companion than I, who is mortal, and does not have so many ideas. But I am a god, and through it all I keep watch over you in every endeavor of yours. And now I tell you this plainly. Even though there were fifty battalions of mortal people standing around us, furious to kill in the spirit of battle, even so you could drive away their cattle and fat sheep. So let sleep take you now. There is annoyance in lying awake and on guard all night. You will soon be out of your troubles. So she spoke and scattered slumber over his eyelids, and she, shining among goddesses, went back to Olympus. But when the sleep had caught him, a relaxing sleep, slipping the cares from his mind, at that time his virtuous wife wakened in turn and cried, sitting up in her soft bed. But after she had satisfied all her desire with weeping, then she, shining among women, prayed first of all to Artemis. Artemis, goddess and queen, daughter of Zeus, how I wish that with the cast of your arrows you could take the life from inside my heart this moment, or that soon the storm wind would snatch me away and be gone, carrying me down misty pathways, and set me down where the recurrent ocean empties his stream, as once the storm winds carried away the daughters of Pandorius. The gods killed their parents, and they were left there, orphaned in the flat palace, and radiant Aphrodite tended them and fed them with cheese and sweet honey and pleasant wine. And Hera granted to them, beyond all women, beauty and good sense. And chaste Artemis gave them stature, and Athena instructed them in glorious handiwork. But when bright Aphrodite had gone up to tall Olympus to request for these girls the achievement of blossoming marriage, from Zeus who rejoices in the thunder, and he well knows all things, the luck and the lucklessness of mortal people, Meanwhile, the seizing storm winds carried away these maidens and gave them over into the care of the hateful furies. So I wish that they who have their homes on Olympus would make me vanish, or sweet-haired Artemis strike me, so that I could meet the Odysseus I long for, even under the hateful earth, and not have to please the mind of an inferior husband. Yet the evil is endurable when one cries through the days, 
with heart constantly troubled, yet still is taken by sleep in the night. For sleep is oblivion of all things, both good and evil, when it has shrouded the eyelids. But now the God has sent the evil dreams thronging upon me. For on this very night there was one who lay by me, like him as he was when he went with the army, so that my own heart was happy. I thought it was no dream, but a waking vision. So she spoke, and dawn of the golden throne came on her. Great Odysseus was aware of her voice crying, and pondered then, and it seemed to him in his mind that now she was standing by his head and had recognized him already. He rolled together the blanket and fleece where he had been sleeping, and laid them down by the chair in the hall, and taking the ox hide out, laid it down, and prayed to Zeus with his hands lifted. Father Zeus, if willingly you gods led me over wet and dry to my land, after giving too much affliction, let one of the waking people send me an omen from inside the house. And let Zeus also show me an outside portent. So he spoke in prayer, and Zeus of the councils heard him. Immediately he sent his thunder from shining Olympus high above the clouds, and noble Odysseus was happy. And from the house a mill woman sent him an omen. She was nearby, where the shepherd of the host had set up his handmills, and there twelve women in all had been bending to grind the wheat and the barley flour men's marrow. The others, since they had finished grinding their wheat, by now were sleeping. But this one had not ended her work, and she was the weakest. She stopped the mill and spoke aloud, a sign for her master. Father Zeus, you who are lord of the gods and people, now you have thundered loud from the starry sky, although there is no cloud. You show this forth a portent for someone. Grant now also for wretched me this prayer that I make you. On this day, let the suitors take for the last and la la latest time their desirable feastings in the halls of Odysseus. For it is they who have broken my knees with heart sore labor as I grind the meal for them. Let this be their final feasting. So she spoke. And great Odysseus welcomed the ominous speech and the thunder of Zeus. He thought he would punish the sinners. The other serving women in the fine house of Odysseus had gathered and were lighting the weariless fire on the fireplace. Telemachus, a man like a god, rose up from his bed and put on his clothes and slung a sharp sword over his shoulder. Underneath his shining feet he bound the fair sandals and then caught up a powerful spear edged with sharp bronze he came and stood on the threshold and spoke now to Euryclea. Dear nurse, how have you treated the stranger guest in our house? With food and a bed? Or has he been left to lie uncared for? That is the way my mother is, though she is sensible. Impulsively she favors the wrong man, the worst one among mortals, and lets the better man go, unfavored. Then in turn, circumspect Euryclea said to him, Child, do not find fault with her this time. She is blameless. For he sat here and drank his wine as he himself wanted, but he said he had no more hunger for food. She asked him, but afterward, when he was thinking of rest and sleep, then she did tell the serving women to make up his bedding. But it was he, as one forever wretched and without fortune, who would not sleep in a bed nor under blankets, but in the raw hide of an ox and under fleeces. He slept in the forecourt, and we put a blanket over him. So she spoke, and Telemachus went out through the palace, holding a spear, and a pair of light-footed dogs went with him. He went off to the assembly to join the strong greed Achaeans. But Euryclea, shining among women, the daughter of Ops, the son of Pesinor, gave orders to the maidservants. To work. Some of you keep busy sleeping in the palace, and freshen the floor with water, and lay the purple coverlets over the well-wrought chairs. Some others wash all the tables thoroughly clear with sponges, and clean the wine bowls, also the rot and double-handled drinking cups. Others be off now to the spring to fetch the water, and come back quickly, for the suitors will not long be away from the palace, but will arrive very early, since this is a public festival. So she spoke, and they listened well to her, and obeyed her, and twenty of them went on their way to the spring of dark water, while others, remaining in the house, did their work expertly. Then the haughty men servants came in, and these presently split the firewood well and expertly. And now the women came back from the spring, and next after them came the swineherd driving in three porkers, which were the best in his keeping. These he left to graze inside the handsome enclosure, while he himself spoke to Odysseus in words of endearment. 
friend? Have the Achaeans been giving you more regard, or do they slight you still in the halls as they did earlier? Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him, How I wish, Eumaeus, the gods would punish the outrage these men do in the violence of their reckless designs here in the house of another man. They have no gift of modesty. Now these two were conversing thus with each other. Melanthios, who was the herdsman of the goats, approached them, driving the goats that showed the best in all of his goat flocks to be the suitor's dinner. Two other herdsmen followed him. Melanthios tethered the goats under the echoing portico, and he himself now spoke to Odysseus in terms of revilement. Stranger, are you still to be here in the house to pester the gentleman with your begging? Will you not take yourself outside and elsewhere? I think that now you and I can no longer part until we have tried our fists. There is nothing orderly about your begging, and other occasions are feasting elsewhere. So he spoke. Resourceful Odysseus gave him no answer, but shook his head in silence, deeply devising evils. The third man to come in was Philodius, leader of the people, driving in for the suitors a barren cow and fat goats. The ferryman had brought these over. They give conveyance to people, generally besides whoever comes to them. Philotheos tethered the beasts well under the echoing portico, then went himself and stood close by the swineherd and asked him, Who is this stranger, swineherd, newly arrived to visit this house of ours? From what people does he claim origin? Where is his ancestral place and the land of his fathers? Unlucky man, he is like a king and a lord in appearance. Yet it is true, the homeless men are those whom the gods hold in despite when they spend misery even for princes. He spoke and stood close by Odysseus and offered his right hand and spoke to him aloud and addressed him in winged words, saying, Welcome, father and stranger. May prosperous days befall you hereafter, but now you are held in the grip of many misfortunes. Father Zeus, no god besides is more baleful than you are. You have no pity on me, me once men, once you yourself have created them. You bring them into misfortune and dismal sufferings. It has come home to me when I saw it. My eyes are tearful as I remember Odysseus, since I think he too is wearing such rags upon him as this, and wandering among peoples if he is alive at all anywhere, and looks on the sunlight. But if he is now dead and gone to the house of Hades, I mourn then for blameless Odysseus, who when I was little set me in charge of his oxen in the Caphalian country. Now these cattle are marvelously grown, nor could one better gather an increase of broad-faced cattle than as these are bred. But other men tell me to drive them to place to eat, and they care nothing about the sun in, in the palace, nor tremble before the gods' regard. Now they are grown eager to divide the possessions of the master, who has been absent long. But here is a problem that the heart deep within me has long resolved. While the sun is here, it would be cowardly to take my cattle with me and go to another district and alien men, and yet again it grows worse to stay here, as one set of charge of another men's cattle and, of, and suffer hardships. And long ago I would have escaped from here and gone to some other powerful king, since this is no longer endurable. Yet still I think of that luckless man, how he may come back and all throughout the house may cause the suitors to scatter. Then, resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him, Oxford, since you seem like neither a bad nor a senseless man, and I myself know good sense know what good sense is in you. So I will tell you this, and swear a great oath upon it. Zeus be my witness, first of the gods and the table of friendship, and the hearth of blameless Odysseus, to which I come as a suppliant. Odysseus will come home again, while you are still here in the house, and with your own eyes. If you desire to, you can watch him killing the suitors who are supreme here. Then the herdsmen of oxen spoke in turn and answered him, how I wish, my friend, that the son of Cronos would make good your saying. Then you would see what kind of strength my hands have. So Eumaeus also prayed to all the divinities that they would grant the homecoming of thoughtful Odysseus. Now as these men were conversing thus with each other, the suitors were compacting their plan of death and destruction for Telemachus, and a bird flew over them on the left side. This was a high-flown eagle and carried a tremulous pigeon. Now it was Amphinomos, who spoke forth and addressed him. O oh, friends, this plan of ours to murder Telemachus will not ever be brought to completion, so let us think of our feasting. 
So Amphinomos spoke, and his word was acceptable to them. They, when they had entered the house of God-like Odysseus, laid their mantles down along the chairs and the benches, and set about sacrificing great-sized sheep and fat goats, and sacrificing an ox of the herd and fattened porkers. They roasted the vitals and distributed them, and they blended the wine in the mixing bowls, and the swineherd passed the wine cups about, and Philoetius, leader of men, served them the bread in beautiful baskets, and Melanthios poured the wine for them. They put forth their hands to the good things that lay ready before them. Telemachus, his heart full of guile, seated Odysseus inside the well-constructed hall and by the stone threshold, setting down a poor chair for him and a little table, and set before him a portion of vitals and poured wine for him in a golden drinking cup. And then he spoke a word to him, Take your place here and drink your wine in the men's company. I myself will defend you against the blows and the insults of all the suitors. This house does not belong to the people, but it belongs to Odysseus. He acquired it. This makes it mine. And so, you suitors, hold back your spirit for insults and blows, or else there may be a quarrel and fight between us. So he spoke, and all of them bit their lips in amazement at Telemachus, and the daring way he had spoken to them. Now Antinous, the son of Euphethes, Eupethes, said to him, we Achaeans must accept the word of Telemachus, though it is hard. Now he threatened us very strongly. Zeus, son of Cronos, stopped us. Otherwise, we should before now have put him down in his halls, though he is a lucid speaker. So spoke Antinous, but the other paid no attention. The heralds came through the town, driving the holy hecatomb of the gods, and the flowing-haired Achaeans assembled under the shady grove of him who strikes from afar, Apollo. When they had roasted and taken off the spits, the outer meats, dividing shares, they held their communal feast. Then they who were working set down before Odysseus an equal portion, such as they got themselves. For this was the order of Telemachus before beloved son of godlike Odysseus. And yet Athene would not altogether permit the arrogant suitors to keep from heart-hurting outrage, so to make greater the anguish in the heart of Odysseus, son of Laertes. There was a man among the suitors versed in villainy. Ketesippos was his name, and he had his home in Sami. He, in the confidence of his amazing possessions, courted the wife of Odysseus, who had been so long absent. This man now spoke forth among the insolent suitors. Hear me now, you haughty suitors, while I say something. The stranger has had his share long since, and, as it proper, an equal one. For, it is not well nor just to make light of the guests of Telemachus, who come to him in this palace. Come, let me too give him a guest gift, so he can give it as prize to the woman who washes his feet, or to some other one of the servants in the house of God like Odysseus. He spoke, and with his heavy hand he caught up an ox hoof that lay in the basket, and threw it. Odysseus avoided this by an easy shift of his head. He smiled in his anger, a very sardonic smile. The hoof hit the wall of the well-built house, and Telemachus spoke now and scolded Ketesippos. Ketesippos, it was the better for your heart that it happened so. You missed the stranger. He avoided your missile. I would have struck you with my sharp spear fair in the middle, and instead of your marriage, your father would have been busy with your funeral here. Let none display any rudeness here in my house. I now notice all and know of it, better and worse alike, but before now I was only an infant. Even so, we have to look. Even so, we have had to look on this and endure it all, the sheep flocks being slaughtered, the wine drunk up, and the food, since it is hard for one man to stand off many. Come then, no longer do me harm in your hostility. But if you were determined to murder me with a sharp bronze, then it would be my wish also, since it would be far better than to have to go on watching forever these shameful activities, guests being battered about, or to see you rudely mishandling the serving women all about the beautiful palace. So he spoke, and all of them stayed stricken in silence. At last, Agileos, son of Damastor, spoke forth among them. Dear friends, no man must be angry nor yet with violent answers attack what has been spoken in justice. And do not strike the strangers you have done, 
nor yet any other serving man who is in the house of God like Odysseus. But to Telemachus and his mother, I offer gentle to Telemachus and his mother, I offer gentle advice, if this might be pleasing to the hearts of both of them. As long as the spirits in the hearts of you both were hopeful that Odysseus of the many designs would have his homecoming, then no one could blame you for waiting up for him and, behold, and holding the suitors off in the palace, since that was the better way for you in case Odysseus did come home and return to his palace. But now it has become evident that he will never come back. Come then, sit beside your mother and give her this counsel to marry the one who is the best man and brings the most numerous gifts so you can be happy, control your father's inheritance, and eat and drink while she looks after the house of another. Then the thoughtful Telemachus said to him in answer, But by Zeus, Agileos, I swear, and by the sufferings of my father, who has died or is driven far from Ithaca, I do not delay my mother's marriage. Rather, I urge her to marry the one she wants, and I offer them countless presents. But I am ashamed to drive her unwilling out of the out of the palace with a strict word. May this not be the end God makes of it. So spoke Telemachus, and the suitors' palace Athenes stirred up uncontrollable laughter and addled their thinking. Now they laughed with jaws that were no longer their own. The meat they ate was a mess of blood, their eyes were bursting full of tears, and their laughter sounded like lamentation. Godlike Theoclamenos now spoke among them. Poor wretches, what evil has come on you? Your heads and faces and the knees underneath you are shrouded in night and darkness. A sound of wailing has broken out. Your cheeks are covered with tears and the walls bleed and the fine supporting pillars. All the forecourt is huddled with ghosts. The yard is full of them as they flock down to the underworld and the darkness. The sun has perished out of the sky and a foul mist has come over. So he spoke and all of them laughed happily at him. Eurymachos, son of Polybos, began speaking among them. This stranger, newly come from elsewhere, has lost his senses. Come, young men, and give him an escort out of the palace to get to the marketplace, since everything here is darkness. Then in turn, godlike Theoclimenos answered, Eurymachos, I do, not want, I do not want you to give me an escort. I have eyes, and I have ears, and I have both my feet, and a mind inside my breast which is not without understanding. These will take me outside the house, since I see the evil coming upon you, and not one of the suitors avoiding this will escape. For in the house of God like Odysseus, you are outrageous to men, and all your designs are reckless. So he spoke, and walked out of the well-settled palace, and made his way to Peraios, who hospitably received him. But the suitors now were glancing one at another, trying to tease Telemachus about his guest, and laughing over them. And thus would go the word of one of the arrogant young men. No one has worse luck with his guests than you, Telemachus. Here, for one, somebody brought you in this vagabond who wants his food and his wine, who doesn't know how to do any work, who has no strength, but is just a weight on the good land. And now this other one stood up and began to prophesy. If you would listen to what I say, it'd be far better. Let us put these guests in a vessel with many orlocks and take them to the Sicilians. There they would fetch a good price. So spoke, spoke the suitors, but Telemachus paid no attention, but looked across at his father silently, always waiting for the time when he would lay his hands on the shameless suitors. The daughter of Acarios, circumspect Penelope, had taken her beautiful chair and set it just outside the door, and listened to every word the men in the hall were saying, for these were laughing aloud as they prepared a dinner that was sweet and staying, for they had made a very big sacrifice. But there could, be, there could not be a meal that was more unpleasant than this one. Such was to be the attack that the powerful man and the goddess would make on them, for they had first begun the wrongdoing.